I will, I will shortly turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Kasha Cordes, who will kick off today's conversation. Uh, we are joined by a group of panelists in the main room. Uh, we, I will introduce them shortly. We are also joined by a number of attendees who can hear us now. After Dr. Cordes has kicked off the proceedings, I will go through some Zoom guidance, uh, but we will wait on doing that after Dr. Cordes is gone. Dr. Cordes, you are on. Um. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm Kasha Cordas and together with uh, Professor Samina Raja, I co-direct the Community for Global Health Equity, which we also fondly call CGHC for short. And I um, join uh, Samina in welcoming you to the webinar today and to our series more broadly. So as an intellectual community um, that is dedicated to the promotion of um, equity in education, practice and research, um, the Community of Excellence um, in Global Health Equity is pleased to offer this um, co-production of knowledge for Global Health Equity seminar series. And in this monthly series, we um, will examine a model of knowledge building that may be unfamiliar to some of you. Co-produced knowledge means different things to different people. And by co-produced, we, the organizers, mean a knowledge that is developed under the auspices of cooperative, mutually respectful relationship between people whose practice uh, springs from academia and those whose expertise arises from practice and or uh, lived experience within a given community. Some faculty affiliates um, of CGHC have a long history of co-producing knowledge um, with their community partners. And indeed, um, it is the many conversations that we've had in the, commu uh, in the community uh, on who owns knowledge that um, have served as an impetus for putting together this seminar series. Others, like myself, are new to the practice of co-producing knowledge with communities and are eager to learn and imagine how we can increasingly um, incorporate or replace the ext um, extractive modes of creating knowledge that are so pervasive in academia. Um, before we begin this series, I really want to acknowledge um, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Lisa Vahapoglu, uh, Jessica Skates, and our former research assistant, Nicole Little. Their hard work and dedication has really allowed this series to exist and develop into something that we are um, very proud of, and we're all excited to share this um, series with you. I think it's also important to say that uh, committing to and seriously engaging in the co-production of knowledge is re really critical um, for universities. And I would like to invite um, Dr. Chitra Rajan, um, the vice, um, I'm sorry, the Associate Vice President for Research Advancement um, and Academic Development at University at Buffalo. Um, and she'll share thoughts on why universities need to engage in co-producing knowledge with communities. Thank you very much particularly those they call their neighbors. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Kasha. And thank you very much, Samina and Kasha, for your persistence and creativity in finding a way to host this symposium despite the circumstances that we are in. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, not just, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, not just because it is my job to do so, but because I personally believe in this research paradigm. That is the co-creation of knowledge, where we collaborate with partners and stakeholders in order to benefit from different, what I would like to call knowledge assets. That is the skills, experiences, organizational cultures, etc. I did not arrive at this point a happenstance, but it's a part of a journey that really began with my graduate training, which was a single discipline, single investigative approach to recognizing that complex, persistent societal problems require collaboration that bring together multiple perspectives, both from within and from outside. So I myself have a research project that requires us to work uh, in this fashion, and I know how difficult and at the same time satisfying this can be.
Sorry. Um, I'm breaking up here. Jessica, let me know if I'm still audible. Yes, we can still hear you, Jessica. Okay. So let me go back for a moment to my role at the university. So my job is to help faculty come together to do their best work by facilitating large multidisciplinary teams. And we know how difficult that is because we are not trained to do that as part of our graduate work. And even those of us who work on multidisciplinary projects very rarely learn about the social process for making this happen. So we really need to understand how this process of bringing together teams actually takes place and what are the best uh, transferable lessons from one experience to another. So I am really grateful to both Kasha and to Samina for organizing this amazing agenda. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but this is something that is so important to us if you truly want to solve persistent societal problems. Any discovery and any knowledge that is devoid of context, devoid of any full understanding of the human and the environmental factors cannot help solve these problems. So we need to be more intentional, we need to be more del deliberate so that our collective intellectual capital can really help better our society. Samina asked me if I would, in my official role, help promote this work, and my answer is absolutely yes. Not that I know what's needed, and so I really want to join today as much to learn so that I pers personally can understand how this process is done and what's really needed from a university's point of view to really enable this kind of work. We know how difficult interdisciplinary work is, multidisciplinary work, transdisciplinary work, convergence research. We heard all these buzzwords because we do know that the traditional approach is not working. Something new has to happen. And perhaps for those of you who work in global health, this is not new, but for a lot of faculty, for a lot of faculty, this kind of approach where we start with a societal problem and co-create an understanding so that we have shared production and shared knowledge in order to first understand the problem before we can even attempt to find pathways to how that solution can be determined. There, this myth that knowledge is created within the academia, within our research labs has to be shattered. Knowledge is not just what happens within a laboratory but the collective experiences that really both in our contributors to the understanding of the problem, as well as the solution, and the use of that knowledge to actually implement processes that can actually lead to a better outcome. A few years ago, NSF introduced the idea of convergence and it made it one of its strategic priorities. Yesterday, there was a newsletter about the convergence accelerator problem and here's what the program managers said. The convergence program is a unique new experiment for the National Science Foundation. For decades, the private sector has not been able to justify investment in basic research due to a lack of obvious commercial applications. With the convergence program, we're challenging that notion, engaging with partners who can use their experience to help us support research that can change and enhance American society. So I would add to that, it's not just the private sector, but it is the public that really needs to believe in what a university does. We are a research university. We are an institution of higher learning and the public trust in us has eroded and because it is for good reason, we are viewed as being within our ivory towers of being in complete disconnect with what, real, what is really happening in, in the real world. So we really need to do something new and different so that we can regain the public trust. We need to show that our work is relevant. We need to show that it can be useful. It means we need to step outside, not just our ivory tower, but outside our campus walls. And we need to learn to work with stakeholders and partners if we truly want to make a difference. 
So I look forward to this uh, 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 year long series of talks. Uh, I hope to learn both for myself and what, what I may do as a, in my position to help gather the resources that can help other faculty also learn about this co-production of knowledge. And what a beautiful word that is, co-production of knowledge. This is as a democratized way to, to share knowledge uh, as I can truly imagine. So with that, I hand it back to you, Asha, and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Chitra. Um, and I now hand it over to Samina, who will uh, introduce our speakers. Thank you, Chitra, for uh, the opening and Kasha for passing it on. Before I turn to our distinguished speakers for today's talk, I want to go over a couple of requests for our attendees. Very quickly, we have attendees literally from our home city, Buffalo, New York. We also have attendees from across the country, and I noticed that there are some individuals dialing in from other parts of the world. Welcome to all of you. I ask that you drop your questions and reactions into the chat function of Zoom. For those of you who have not used the chat function, there is an icon for that at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use that. On the left of the chat function is a question and answer function. You can pose a question there as well. I will be monitoring the chat and will direct your questions to our panelists as time goes on. There will be a time to open up for discussion with everybody. We are in a time where we are depending on technology and therefore I request your flexibility with any uh, glitches that we may face. Um, and any surprises, uh, such as my neighbor's dog just barking as I am speaking. Um, we, what, we are grateful that you are here and we cannot think of a better set of speakers to kick off our conversation for the year. With that, allow me to introduce Dr. Charisma AC. I have personally followed Charisma AC's work as she has uh, demonstrated that it is possible to be a planner who is committed to working in communities in the global south, both in the United States and in other parts of the world. To clarify, by global south, we on this call do not mean a geography. We mean a geopolitical condition that leaves people and places out right here in Buffalo or in other parts of the world. You will hear her reflect on that. She's an associate professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning at University of California, Berkeley, and has done extensive work, research, and travel to countries in West Africa, Southern Africa, and Central America. Her work focuses on local and regional environmental sustainability with a focus on poverty reduction, urban governance, environmental justice, and access to basic services that often get overlooked. Um, she is joined by Dr. Margareta Lynn, who is the Executive Director for Just Cities and Ron Mellon's Institute for Social Justice. Trained as an attorney, Margareta would pass off as an urban planner any day, the kind that I would like to have on my team. Her organization demands restorative justice in policy planning and development. She combines her unique experiences in government, community, activism, law, youth development, social enterprises, and collaboration into a force for equity and hope. The two of them are speaking together to illustrate the tradition of co-production. We are grateful for their presence here in Buffalo virtually but I promise you the city will call you in person and we look forward to hosting you in person in Buffalo, New York. I hand it over to you, um, Charisma and Margareta. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Samita. That was a fantastic um, introduction as well as uh, the words well said by um, in academia in a way of decentering the kind of uh, colonialist knowledge production that we engage in right now. 
Um, so it's an honor. Uh, we thank the Center for Excellence in Global Health Equity for inviting us. And we love this um, fantastic. I don't know if Margareta, you want to uh, say anything in reaction before we start? I'm just thrilled to be here and hearing the remarks from our colleagues in Buffalo, just um, it's, it's the right, right sentiments for the right time, um, not just for our nation, but our world. And, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about how uh, we continue to perpetuate racism and white supremacy. And I've come to the thinking that it's because it's so embedded in all of our institutions, including academia. Um, and academia produces our lawyers, produces our government officials, and produces our elected officials, and produces all the people who hold power in our society. So if we can disrupt the mentality and the stories of othering that are so embedded in academia, think about the kind of world we can co-create. So thank you, Charisma, for inviting me, and um, many thanks to our colleagues in Buffalo. Awesome, thank you so much. And um, Margareta will talk about, we're excited we're on together because we're gonna be partnering this spring. Um, and I think you'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, so we're, we're excited to start to share something we get started. All right, thank you all so much for your patience. Uh, it's a challenging time. I have children on a Zoom call right now. I know we're all dealing with this new technological frontier because of the pandemic. Um, so we really appreciate your patience and understanding. Um, so again, the title of today's talk is Countering Structures of Racial and Social Injustice, Community Partnerships in Research and Practice. And Margareta and I will be um, engaged in a conversation today. Um, and we'll start by um, beginning with talking about co-production versus community engagement. What's the difference? Um, because a lot of times we use the terms uh, community-based research or co-production, um, action research, there's all these terms for doing research in part in, together with communities, but that actually mean different things. Um, so we're going to share where we're coming from, uh, or at least where we want to go. We've, we've both done research at, at various ends of the, of the spectrum, but we're going to talk about what we'd like to focus on today. Uh, and then we'll uh, share what motivated us to do the work we do. And then uh, we will move on to talking, uh, providing some examples of co-production and community partnership with the goods and the bad. Um, and, and then ending today, uh, at least the presentation part with reflecting on, on what it takes to do community partnership that's um, transformative and promotes uh, social justice, environmental justice, um, and the challenges of it and, the tr and its transformative potential. Um, and then open it up for Q&A. So that's the plan. I hope. I hope that was um, more audio, the audio was legible that time. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank goodness. All right. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly uh, frame what we're taught, what we'd like to focus on today when it comes to co-producing knowledge. Now this, you may have seen spectra, uh, matrices like this. Um, this is an adaption of a framework for the International Association of Public Participation, but it's been adapted for, for research by the Australian National University. Um, and in that frame, and I'm, I'm using that because I'm, you know, I'm a professor of city regional planning, and when it comes to uh, producing general plans um, or the planning process, whether it's approving new developments, housing complex, um, you know, uh, um, a, a new park, all of those kinds of um, processes that are part of planning, um, public participation is a requirement, um, but often it's done in a very minimal way, you know, just to check the box. Um, and so many of us within our discipline um, are pushing for more, um, more uh, engagement and inclusive approach to, to partnership to improve the process of planning. But besides government and public decision making and planning, this is a useful framework, um, I think, for thinking about the various levels of engaging with partners to produce research. 
So on the one hand, on the left side of your screen, you see informing. The project. So the questions come from the researcher, right? So that's kind of the lowest level of community engagement. Although, and then as you go right along this spectrum, you get more and more. Um, uh, you increase the the influence of of community members or stakeholders in the production of research. Um, so you go from informed to consulting, um, where people have a chance to give feedback on the research process and the design um, to involving them more directly to collaboration. So we wanna even push it all the way to the, you know, kind of off the spectrum, which is more about not just empowering people within structures that research frameworks and structures that already, already exist, but more of a model you may have heard of community-based participatory research, where the emphasis is joining with the community as a as a full and equal partner at every stage of the research process from when you just get an idea or sometimes it's the community members you're supporting that's a lot of the work that um, margaretta and i do we're working with communities and the, the idea itself comes from the from the community it's not from the the from academia but the, the idea for the research question and the design is actually generated by the community members um, and partnering with the community members at every stage of the process and it's, it's a really critical approach to research when you're doing work with vulnerable communities as we do, people who have been victimized by discrimination um, or vulnerable poverty because of living in compromised um, physical environments um, who don't have access to you know, basic needs and basic services. Um, and so it's a, it, it, it is empowering. Um, and it is an important approach to research for community members who often um, don't get a voice in both the decision making that affects their daily lives, much less uh, the production of knowledge. However, with this approach, even though it's a, a kind of desirable, um, not a kind of, it is a desirable mode of research, um, but it also has presents its challenges, which we're going to talk about today. Um, and those challenges are both in terms of, you know, engaging with um, different community members and community members who, and as academics or um, as professionals, there are power uh, imbalances and dynamics in play when we're when we seek to partner with community. So how do we deal with that? There are cultural issues. Um, you may have heard the term public health. Term competency. Um, a colleague of mine, Elizabeth Sweet, in planning talks about cultural humility, which is even a, 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 a different approach which we can talk about. You know, how do you approach working with different community members? And then there are ethical issues when it comes to uh, working with, uh, partnering with communities to produce knowledge for social change. So those are the things that we have like to um, talk, about, talk about today. Um, and we're going to begin with talking about what got us into this work in the first place, kind of the, the journey. So we'll both give a brief uh, kind of uh, background on who we are and what we do, and then talk about some example uh, example projects. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mark. Oh, sorry, Samina. Uh, Charisma, over. as soon as Margareta starts talking, would you mind testing if star six will unmute your phone on your end? Just one okay, request. Um, okay, perfect. Margareta. Okay, thank you so much, Samina. All right, and so now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Margareta. Awesome, thank you so much, Charisma. And I um, apologize that I'm also having some tech issues on my end and, and I hope to be able to um, remain with me. Oh, um, um, Charisma, I think feedback from your phone. Okay, um, so I, I wanted to, so Crispa and I made a pinky promise with one another regarding today's conversation with everyone, which is that um, we have learned uh, working inside of elite institutions to silence our stories. 
in order to survive, to fit in, and to thrive. So um, we both believe that the times that we're living in demand us to be our full selves, to, to stand in our full powers, and that includes really recognizing and, and claiming our, our stories. And so we're doing something today in trust of this, um, of you all, um, to hold um, our, our authentic selves. And we normally don't share in the way that we're about to share today. Um, so I'm going to go first, and then I'm going to talk Team Charisma. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a picture of um, my mother, Yi Chen. Um, my sister Jean and myself, um, I'm on the left. And this is a picture of us when we first came to this country. Um, uh, shortly after the Chinese Exclusion Act was lifted, in reality, and um, it took the 1968 Immigration and Naturalization Act to do that. And um, so what motivates me and the work that I have uh, done these many years is really um, my experiences of exclusion because of um, who we are and our identity and our affiliation. And so um, we I directly experienced the impact of family separation because I did not meet my father for the first time until I was four years old because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, my work around education um, justice came from um, uh, my own experiences of being tracked into special education because I could not speak English and Philadelphia had nothing resembling bilingual education. Um, so I spent so much of my childhood feeling stupid because of um, being labeled special ed. Um, my work around racial reconciliation came because of our experiences around racial bullying and hate crimes in our neighborhoods, including in Rochester, New York. And, um, and most of all, my experiences around justice and bringing people together to solve big problems of our times comes from the love that my mother gave me, which was so grounding and centering and, and got me through the hard times in life. And it came from the belief that my mentors, like former Congressman Ron Dellums and the great poet June Jordan, the belief they had in me at times when I didn't believe in myself. And so um, the work that I do around community partnership and inclusion really comes from the pain and suffering that I experienced of being excluded and marginalized. Um, so tag team over to Charisma. So I was thanking Margareta for sharing, for sharing uh, her, her story, um, her powerful story of facing discrimination and how that motivates her work. And we did promise um, to do that today. And it's not always easy to talk about. And I just made a brief point that it's also, it's not just producing the knowledge that's important, but diversity and representation is also important in academia because there's uh, a greater pool, you know, people who are asking the research questions and connected to different communities will come read different questions um, and different and different perspectives when it comes to, to research. And so um, oh, I think this is interesting that. I'm that. Okay. <laughs> so um, I, so my picture I wanted to share is of um, public housing. Um, on the left is are the Hayes homes, um, which were built in the in the 30s in York, New Jersey. Um, they were part of you know massive uh, low rent housing for for the poor, um, and the country's experiment in public housing originally for post war post World War II workers, and then in the 50s became um, commissioned for the broader population. And, and in the beginning, my grand, so my grandparents were um, sharecroppers, um, which was the system that replaced slavery, where they, it was just kind of a new form of slavery, where they had to um, essentially pay for the land they worked with a large proportion of the crops. And so my grandfather's oldest brother moved from Macon, Georgia, to Newark, New Jersey, and 
um, started working, uh, you know, blue collar jobs and saved up money and one by one brought each of his 13 brothers and sisters to live in York, New Jersey. And um, that's where, uh, where my family began. Um, my mother and aunts and uncles were born in public housing in York. And when they first moved in, it was uh, somewhat integrated. There were Jewish families, uh, working class Jewish families, as well as, as black families um, that moved into Hayes Homes and other public housing projects. But over time, because of policies of uh, racially restrictive covenants that prevented people as they, you know, progressed economically from moving out of the inner city and into the suburbs, and, that, and those policies were by race, um, were based on race, racial discrimination, um, and also policy, policies of mortgage redlining that, uh, didn't, that didn't allow uh, black people to buy homes in, the, in their own communities. Over time, um, the, the community, this this public housing structure, whatever you think of the design of, of public housing, you know, these big towers kind of disconnected from streets with all these talks, but it was really the policies of enforced racial segregation that led to these becoming places that were very racially homogenous, mostly African-American. Uh, over time, this, um, public housing became disinvested, no maintenance, um, you know, run down, health hazards, and so forth, and, you know, have the reputation that they have today. Um, and eventually started to become demolished and replaced with a new form of housing that, you know, low townhomes uh, that are now kind of replacing these, these um, large structures. But a lot of the, the systems and the legacy of institutionalized segregation remain, remain in place along with a lot of the problems, even though the housing looks different today. Um, so I have on the left a picture of kind of when it was first commissioned and, you know, bright and shiny, beautiful, and all this hope. And then on the right, in the lower right corner, you see, um, you know, one of the, the, the homes before they were um, demolished in the 90s and um, all the broken glass in the foreground. And I remember that broken glass growing up. We played with it like you would play with seashells um, at, the, at the beach. And you don't know when you're young um, that you're living in poverty. And a lot of the research, you know, that I've come across when it comes to understanding poverty, you know, looks at it in terms of the physical conditions, but not in terms of understanding um, the communities that live in them, somehow equating the physical environment with the people that live in those environments. Um, when, when my experience of growing up in Hayes Homes were ones of strong community, of baseball games, of, of uh, strong mutual aid, of support, and because, and interestingly, because of discrimination, you have a wide range of income classes uh, that live in inner city areas as well. Um, and, and so, it's much more complex and nuanced, and those are some of the things we'll talk about today um, in terms of our project. So coming from that, that background, trying to understand why certain communities live in poverty um, while others don't, and kind of the history of that certainly led to my motivation. And then, um, sorry, and then um, just briefly on, on the slide, eventually I began a career in international uh, development, working in uh, Zimbabwe on projects of human rights and HIV AIDS, Angola uh, during the civil war and then in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and, and that work in international development led me to go back to the PhD um, to uh, kind of understand the, the disconnect between kind of high level policies of poverty alleviation and the reality of life um, on the ground. And so that work has involved uh, access to water, sanitation, um, energy, food, um, as well as uh, uh, voice and engagement in public decision making. So all of those experiences, both the personal experience and what I've seen, um, you know, the parallels uh, between injustices in um, decision making and, and discrimination around the world and, and the United States motivate uh, motivate this work. So on that note, I'd like to turn it uh, over to Margareta. We're going to talk about some of our work and, and our and our examples of projects of, of uh, community partnering. Great, thank you, Charisma, and yay, we did it. <laughs> Good role modeling. Um, so the I have three examples to share around what we mean by co-production of knowledge and change work. Um, the first story is a sad story about the, um, the impact of human lives when we um, don't do that kind of work. Um, so this, uh, oh, um, 
This is a picture of uh, Mrs. Yen Ham, who um, uh, was born and raised in China and um, was a refugee to the United States and um, uh, spent um, most of her um, adult life um, uh, doing all the right things in the world, raising her family, um, being a contributor to her community. And um, that's a picture of her son, Sam. Um, Mrs. Hom came into uh, prominence media attention when she, along with 49 of her other neighbors, were being evicted from her home in Oakland, Chinatown um, during the first dot-com boom in, in Oakland, which was um, in 2003. Um, and just a little background on Oakland, Chinatown, similar to other Chinatowns um, uh, around this country, um, the current configuration uh, of Chinatown in Oakland is the fifth Chinatown. So every time um, uh, Chinese Americans created a place to belong um, and a, a home for themselves, um, once uh, they took abandoned blighted land and made it productive, um, uh, white supremacists came along and took it over. So um, the Chinatown that exists today um, uh, borders uh, downtown Oakland and it's the fifth iteration of people trying to have home in this country. Um, so in 2003, oh, let me just share that. Um, in the uh, 70s, 60s and 70s, um, there was uh, a lot of displacement happening in the uh, current Chinatown with um, different uh, transportation, other public agencies, municipal agencies taking over land um, and displacing longtime residents. There was a 20 year struggle, community struggle to hold on to land. Um, and which resulted in the creation of a plaza in the heart of Chinatown so people can have a library. Um, they can have affordable housing and they can have amenities that um, low income people uh, needed. Um, so Mrs. Hom uh, resided in one of those 50 units of affordable housing that took 20 years of community resistance and, and struggle to, to build. Um, so in 2003, Mrs. Hom and other residents of Pacific Renaissance Plaza all received an eviction notice from their landlord. They were shocked because they were told that this was housing that the city of Oakland had subsidized. So they thought that they were going by moving into the, um, the affordable housing they would be able to um, live in peace for the rest of their remaining days. Um, and this was a time period when housing was um, becoming very unaffordable in, in Chinatown because of its proximity to downtown and the dot-com boom. Um, so I attended, I was working um, as a clinical director at the East Bay Community Law Center at the time, and was asked to attend a community meeting. And um, it broke my heart hearing the stories of Mrs. Hom and other tenants. Um, they were first uh, traumatized because um, it, uh, receiving the eviction notice was really triggering their displacement and refugee experiences. Um, they also didn't know um, what options they had. They didn't know what they where they could go, where they could um, what they could afford, um, and um, they were people who uh, didn't know what how to advocate for themselves in the U.S. Um, political system. Um, so myself and other advocates who were there we stood up and, and said to Mrs. Hum and the other tenants, if you're willing 
to stand up for your rights, we will stand with you. And that led me into a, a journey to understand what was happening with the city of Oakland, um, the uh, what I call corruption in city hall. Um, the landlord was a major developer, not just in Oakland, but globally. And his family were among the 10 wealthiest families in Hong Kong. Um, they, uh, you know, took elected officials on junkets to Hong Kong. Um, city officials told us this is a really good developer. It took um, four years of, of litigation um, or threat to sue the city of Oakland if, if they didn't join our lawsuit against the developer and transformation in City Hall with the um, political uh, campaign of getting a new mayor, Ron Dellums, our former congressman, for, for justice to occur for Pacific Renaissance Plaza. But during those four years, um, many of the tenants, including Mrs. Hom, passed away. That the stress of being under the threat of eviction um, was so stressful, was so harmful, that people um, died prematurely. And that to me was an incredible lesson about what happens, the, the, um, the human cost when we don't care about one another. Um, the government response and the nonprofit housing response to the plight of Mrs. Hum, the other tenants, was to ship them to someplace else that was more affordable than Chinatown. And when we said, this is their home and they need to live in Chinatown, people did not understand. They did not listen to people like Mrs. Tom about what they needed. Um, so uh, let's move on to a better story. <laughs> Next picture. So when I, kind of by accident, uh, started working at the city of Oakland, including um, serving as the deputy city administrator and helping to run the city of Oakland when Ron Dellums um, became mayor. Um, I took those experiences of exclusion and discrimination and, and the human suffering that comes from that experience um, into government. And um, I saw myself as a, as a bridge to community for our work inside of, of government. And um, what the second example is a good story example of what's possible, um, the transformation and the justice that's possible when um, we partner in authentic ways with community. Uh, this is a picture of um, residents of East Oakland it's an area of Oakland that has the highest rates of crime, violence, poverty, um, ill health. Um, and it's also a place um, that a number of people call home. It's actually um, has the most ethnically diverse um, neighborhoods in America. Um, and you have people speaking over 66 different languages in parts of East Oakland. Um, there's a strong tradition of, of pride and Black power. It's where the Black Panther Party was actually um, formed and, and created. Um, so to make a long story short, community folks came to me and said, um, let's invest in East Oakland because it had been redlined, it had been um, divested uh, from, from decades of um, uh, impact of white flight, government and private disinvestment. Um, and I said, yes, let's, let's, let's do it, but let's do it in an authentic way. And so that involved us creating a major initiative that we called the Oakland Sustainable Neighborhoods Initiative, um, where we brought over 40 different community, faith, 
labor, government entities, and other public agencies to, together to say, let's invest our caring, our resources, our collective brilliance um, to revitalize East Oakland neighborhoods in ways that centered the leadership of residents and also um, create uh, um, economic prosperity in ways that don't displace our longtime residents and small businesses. Um, and this is a picture of people who are part of what we call the, a community planning leaders program. So we invested in leadership development of residents to be part of a three-year initiative every step of the way. We created um, working group structures for shared power that were um, co-facilitated by um, someone in government along with a community leader. So we did everything that's textbook, right? However, towards the end of our first year of the initiative, um, people were in the community were unhappy. There were conflicts happening in the working groups because um, both city officials and community leaders were not used to working in this way of collaboration and partnership after so many decades of um, mistrust and adversarial relationships. Um, the, the residents um, felt like they were not holding sufficient power um, in, in the collaboration itself. So at the end of year one, we were close to breaking apart. And um, we had a all day meeting where it was um, kind of a come to Jesus moment for the group around, um, did we want to stay together? Did we want to realize the power of the collaboration and the collective um, or did we, was it just too hard and there were too many conflicts and did we want to go our separate ways? Um, fortunately, we decided to work through those issues, created new structures that felt um, more empowering for everyone involved. Um, and the initiative resulted in um, commitments that totaled over 850 million from public agencies, philanthropy, um, community-based organizations. And um, new affordable housing projects um, came as a, a result of this work. Um, this new uh, successor initiative called the East Oakland Black Culture Zone and the CDC that's community run also came out of it. So a lot of great things um, came as the result of people willing to stay together and work through the conflicts. Next picture. So I think we all know who this is. <laughs> it's our beautiful friend, Charisma. And my last story is about Charisma and, um, and the partnership that we have today, um, which really um, uh, is counter to the normal academic extraction and exploitation that normally occurs. Um, so I last spring had the great privilege of uh, co-designing and co-teaching a new course in urban studies around what restorative justice and planning and public policy making looks like with my um, friend and colleague, Dan Lindheim. Um, he allowed me to um, take all the things I've been thinking about and experiment with the class that he was teaching in urban studies. Um, it resonated with um, the students taking the course. Carissa, Charisma heard about me and she reached out. And um, in our first meeting, I think we fell in love. <laughs> and I shared with her something that I had um, we had designed years ago with a former colleague who uh, left Berkeley for a different institution, which is the creation of a center on racial healing and justice. And Charisma said to me, let's do it. And what's been, and you know, I said to her, um, Charisma, to be honest, I have trauma 
from having um, been dumped by our former colleague who, who left us for greener pastures. And um, if um, I'm willing to take this on with you, but it, it needs, I just have to be honest with how I'm feeling. <laughs> and um, Charisma has been this amazing partner where we create, co-create work plans on um, our activities and next steps, including um, co-teaching a class together this uh, coming spring on transformative justice at the intersections of criminal injustice and housing justice, including working with formerly incarcerated leaders on that, um, that new class and projects. And um, it's just been so healing to work with her because of my prior experiences with people, people in academia who have taken my knowledge, who have taken my ideas, and um, without crediting where it came from, um, are written up things that um, were um, the opposite of what I said, or of what uh, truth on the ground looked like. And um, so it's it's been, Charisma is my third and last example, and want to really express love and gratitude to her for role modeling what co-production of knowledge and co-production co of justice looks like. Wow. Can you hear me, Margareta? Okay. <laughs> oh, you're going to make me cry. It doesn't occur in a public forum, but, you know, what we do, but I, I think it's important to acknowledge emotion. I do sometimes, uh, since we're keeping it real today on this conversation, um, you know, when we're talking about, uh, first of all, thank you for that, for sharing your examples, um, and also for the, the really kind, <laughs> your really kind words, and I'm super excited about what we're about to do. We're about to change the game of things at, at Berkeley, so, um, yeah, it's exciting, and, and yes, I'm in love. <laughs> Um, and so, I, but I want to acknowledge emotion as part of this work too, because um, I think I think Margaret, when we were preparing for this, we talked about how in, in government and public, you know, the word love is not used. You're you're although you're creating, especially planning, you're creating neighborhoods for people to live in where they're gonna, you know, raise their families, and you know that, and where and we know where you're born has an impact on your life outcomes, your social mobility. Um, it's deeply personal. It's working. You know, if you go to a public forum <laughs> about, you know, some change, some proposed zoning change or a new development, how emotional those meetings um, get, right? And so, um, love and emotion and care is is central to this work. And yet, we try in public service to be dispassionate and so-called objective. And I'm going to talk about that in the end when we have our reflection. Because um, there's this great article on the habits of white supremacy that I've been sharing with my class uh, that a colleague introduced to me, and now I'm doing it to, for us to talk about in terms of cultural norms and you know how we treat each other in the classroom, but also reflecting on what we're what we're going to experience when we go out and practice. Um, and sometimes you know we're talking about the issues of like you were talking about Chinatown and the people's connection to community and displacement. You know, those, those, that's, you know, that's, and, and the fact that, you know, people think the solution is just finding affordable housing somewhere else and not recognizing the connection uh, to place. And so when we talk about these things in the classroom, and I'm going to turn to the next slide, I don't to get emotional. I'm not talking about people, you know, losing generations of homes or um, people not having enough clean water to drink. Imagine, you know, every day going having to search for clean water. Um, because the government isn't providing it for you. And in development, we treat it as a technical problem, but really it's a political problem. Um, and so in this slide, I have um, what I call a tale of two, <coughs> sorry, this is up here. Okay. tale of two cities, which is, um, this is Lagos, Nigeria, where I do a lot of my uh, field work, my dissertation was based in Lagos, and we focused on access to water and sanitation, the fact that in a mega city of uh, over 20 million people, uh, the majority of people don't get piped water, and so what do people do? How do they cope? Um, where is their voice in decision-making? How do they, you know, uh, you know, 
to cope with their lives when, when they don't have, you know, access to basic services. And one of the things, whenever I show slides about poverty in Lagos or in other parts of Africa, it's also important to show slides of the tremendous wealth that is also there. And it's really a question of inequality. Uh, and so on the right is a rendering of this uh, massive development. And it's part of this new wave of capital that flowed into Africa after the 2008, uh, you know, uh, economic collapse and the housing uh, crisis. Capital was looking for a place to call home. And it's, it's, it's been coming to Africa, you know, kind of the last to get it, which is like, there, again, those parallels, you know, when you think about African people in the diaspora and uh, what's happening on the continent. But money is flowing into real estate in Africa to build these satellite cities and and new developments catering to the elite. And so this is a rendering of a, of a massive land reclamation project off the coast of Lagos in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's about three quarters the size of Manhattan. And, you know, Chevron was the first to buy a plot. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the plots are all sold out. And it's not quite finished. Uh, you see this, the rendering from Google Earth on the bottom left is what it looked like in 2009, 2013. Um, you can see the land being filled in. And then I, I took my students uh, there last year, and the buildings are now being erected, these skyscrapers. And they're planning for 24-hour water and electricity in a, in a metropolitan area where two-thirds are living on $2 a day or less don't have secure housing, are getting water, as you see on the left, from, you know, informal vendors who lay PVC pipes through the street. And when I first started working in water, the folks who do, who do this, these, like laying the, the pipes in the street, you know, in the literature were perceived, perceived as the bad guys. And yes, there are some criminal elements and cartels who are involved in delivering services to the community. Well, what are the communities supposed to do? Um, when the state is not, you know, violating human rights, actually, and not providing people with clean water and sanitation. And so by talking with community members, my whole engagement around water and what it means to provide clean water and sanitation changed. I didn't see the informal uh, vendors um, and, and others who amass their own capital to provide water as, as um, something to be eradicated in place of pipes. In talking to people, you see that these people work, the vendors work with them in terms of how they pay, um, deliver services in the way they want to, you know, they want to be served and that they have more of a voice in, you know, provide in, in these services. And so I started to think about how do we work with uh, the, these people as well as the women and children who are also the backbone of the water and sanitation infrastructure in this, in this metropolitan area where the state politically is not providing water to certain communities in order to erase them, in order to erect new forms of housing. Um, so just, it's just interesting there's so many parallels between what's happening in other parts of the world um, and what we see uh, in, in the United States as well. Uh, and so some of those projects, um, I'm going to go through uh, this very quickly. Um, like I said, human rights to water sanitation is a big part of my work. Water is big business in Nigeria, and they're trying to privatize a lot of protests against that. This is uh, in a context where the percentage of pipe water, in contrast to the Millennium Development Goal, where everybody was trying to reduce by half the number who lack clean water sanitation globally and reduce uh, in the, the, what, what are ca called by the United Nations slum communities that lack, um, you know, clean water sanitation adequate uh, in terms of durable housing um, or live in overcrowded housing or have insecure tenure. All those areas are, are called slums officially by the UN, but that's describing the physical environment. The push was to reduce those areas and reduce people that don't have access to water, but um, Nigeria countered that trend with um, a drop in the people who had access to pipe water. So people are just drinking water straight from the ground um, through deep water wells. And they're trying to push this strategy of private, privatization. Um, so that's one of the questions I was looking at. There's a lot of protests around privatization. Um, and when you talk to people, I'm kind of moving through slides quickly, and I'm sorry about that, but if you have particular questions about this, we can you know, talk during a Q&A. But I, I, I have these slides to contrast why it's so important to engage with with residents, with people living, you know, in places when you're doing doing research. So on the on the one hand, you have this quote. You know, I interviewed a local government chairman uh, in one of one of the communities that I was partnering with to understand um, the human right to water. And I'll talk about the methods we use, um, you know, in partnership with the community, how we co-designed the questionnaire and questions, and then collected the data together. But you talk to the chairman, and you know, the chairman is saying all these. Things, oh, the community knows what they want. You know, we strive to invite them, you know, to the meeting and get their opinion, that kind of community engagement in our consultation model. 
Um, and so they're saying that they do, they, and they do hold public meetings. They do, you know, there is a community development chairman, uh, and they do consult with people. But then when you talk to the to the to the chairman in this one community, he was telling me about this project that had been commissioned um, by the local government, and he, he said, "Oh, you saw there the local government. It was a water project that no longer worked. You know, the taps were dry. You know, they turned the taps for me. Showed no water flowing through the project." He said, "It's a useless project. It's a camouflage project. Water ran for six months." Then they dried up. Politically, they did it halfway. They abandoned it. Instead of giving it to the community, they didn't do that. And this is what we see: no water, nothing. So it's not. When we talk about you know working in development, it's not. Um, and it's oftentimes you, you see a lot of solutions. They're trying to technical solutions. Oh, new ways to carry water, put them in a barrel. You know, all these kind of technical challenges to make up for the state not providing the services they're supposed to provide to community members or supporting community community members and getting that service. And when you work, when you talk with community members, you get that perspective to understand the politics of what's happening, and you have to incorporate that in your research if you're actually going to solve the problem. Um, there's a really great scholar, Jill Vigel, who writes. If you, she 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 studies um, you know, development and poverty and gender um, in, the, in the context of, of uh, global development, and she has a great article called um, "Do We Value Social Resources or Capitalize on Them?" And a lot of times in research, when we're working with community partners, it's, we look at it in an instrumental way. We want to work with community partners because, it's, especially if they've already an organized um, organization, because it's easy, right? It's, you know, a project will go smooth, we have a point person to talk to, it makes the project work better. Um, as opposed to uh, working with the community to transform their political situation, to increase their voice, to overcome whether, like in the United States, we know there's issues of representation due to gerrymandering and the political process or people not being denied the right, people being denied the right to vote. In Nigeria, it's issues of people um, being illegally evicted from their homes and not having due process, court decisions being ignored. And so to study access to water in that context without looking at the political issues that underlie that, incorporating that in your research, and thinking about what is your responsibility as a researcher, um, you know, going into that context, you know, all you're doing is collecting data, but you're not, you're not, um, there's an ethical issue, I would say, that's involved in that. And so that's something we have to confront, especially when we're, we're doing research that is um, around equity and working with inequality and vulnerable populations. And so this, these, these, uh, these challenges tra transcend my work. Whether we're, this was an article I wrote on green collar jobs and post in African cities, um, based on work with a, a colleague I worked with, uh, Thomas Colhane, where we work with community members to uh, design biogas solutions and and understand bottom up ways of generating energy and the ways that the state, you know, often um, discourages or even cracks down on these alternative modes. So there's things that celebrate in the West as kind of new approaches to environment, you know, and and, and Clean energy and green, living green in the city, um, often are not supported by uh, formal policy. And so the research shifted from the technology to understanding the policies that either suppress or promote um, these these uh, alternative solutions to a post carbon uh, post carbon economy. So again, how, by working with communities, you start getting at what the real issue and what the questions are that we should be asking, as opposed to looking at just the manifestation of the problem, which is the lack of clean energy. Um, and then this takes us back to the picture um, that was on the in the beginning on the I think uh, one of the slides in the beginning of the presentation. On the left, um, it, this is another project um, based on this amazing organization in Lagos called Justice and Department Initiative that works with the Nigerian Slum Settlement Federation. And what they're doing is trying to put themselves on the map, and you can see that literally by enumerating their communities and their needs. Um, uh, because on the right, as you see, as Legos develops projects like that big Echo Atlantic development that's the size of Manhattan that I showed a few slides ago, it, or any area that's near the, those developments, just like the Tech 20 raised property values in, in the East Bay, you know, this, this new development is raising the, the value of land um, anywhere near the water and near it. And so there, the government is actually bulldozing people who've lived in places for generations. It's a very violent process. There's been a few people who died. Um, in this process of illegal eviction, um, and yet community members are still going to court trying to fight for the rights, but the state isn't respecting court decisions. And so the new process has been to um, just, you know, do what the state is supposed to do. So enumerate their own communities, enumerate their needs, put themselves on the map, and 
show their value and engage, which they shouldn't have to, but they but and, and but they they have to somehow intervene in the process of development. And so partnering with um, with JEI and with Nigerian Some Settlements Federation, yes, we're we're studying the dynamics of housing and infrastructure in Lagos, but we're also supporting their efforts to actually get the right to live where they live for generations. You know, and so that's how research can also be part of social social transformation. And so in this work, um, well, mixed methods are important. Um, so you got to speak the language of the policymaker. So you got to, you know, capture the quantitative data. Um, and, you know, through, and so we do that through surveys. Um, but qualitative data is also important. I have this in the middle. This, the middle map is a little fuzzy for whatever reason on this. On this is an image of um, this is actually a project in Columbus, Ohio, where again um, we were looking at it was we, we had some uh, money from the Obama Neighborhood Stabilization Program uh, when that existed, <laughs> and we were seeking, we were looking at creating a, a food district in a neighborhood facing gentrification near the Ohio State University. Um, and we built a partnership between uh, the neighborhood association, uh, the campus um, development arm, you know, a bunch of students and researchers, as well as the, the county and city government, um, and developers and private developers. Um, and so one piece of this project, we were doing community mapping of an area. And so we, we asked community members to identify what were the important landmarks and, and um, you know, streets and boundaries and paths in the neighborhood and to color code them in terms of what was good and what was bad. So the red you see in the map were the bad and the more blue or green were the good areas. And just quickly to say through this process, we a few things emerged. Um, even though we were doing this for research, we found out trash not being collected. We found out where the problem areas were, but we also found the, the paths that, you know, the older women in the neighborhood were using to do their morning walks and jobs that they didn't want to be redeveloped. And so this is information that's not in any existing database. You don't get it until you talk to people. Uh, and so by doing this, we then took their maps, turned them into GIS, again, to capture the, the quantitative data so we can overlay that with, with you know, uh, databases that developers and government have, you know, as they plan for development. So they have the community information in the same format that they have, you know, the other information that they use to plan um, for new housing or new projects in the community. So you just know the demonstration of how this kind of data gathering is so critical. And then participatory GIS, this is an um, illustration from the water project where we have partnered with community members to design the indicators around to water. And then um, they identified youth that, that we worked with to train and how to do smartphone ethnography. We put the surveys on phones and then collected the data. And then they went out and we, and we went with them uh, to troubleshoot um, to collect that data in a way where we could collect survey data, take photos that were geotagged and connected to those surveys. And then I'm going to show you in the next slide what ended up happening with that. Um, so in this way, on the left, the left picture is um, what we took with that data with the smartphone ethnography. We then, as a research team, partnering with community members who could not get an audience with the, 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 the Water Corporation to advocate, it was two communities we were working with that didn't have pipe water. Um, we were able to get an audience with the, the CEO of the Water Corporation, all their heads of staff. There was some high level politics going on because the Congressional Black Caucus was actually um, very vocally um, objecting to the plans for privatization in Lagos and so there was a lot of pressure and so we kind of capitalized, we're able to capitalize on that moment and get an audience with the head of the corporation, with community members, our students and our data and um, get them to promise that they would provide uh, water to these two communities. Um, so that's the good piece. But the bad side, because um, we, right we were going to talk about the good and the bad, um, is that shortly after we left, the water corporation was removed from office uh, as well as as a staff. And so we're in the process of rebuilding those relationships. So those are some of the challenges also <laughs> of doing the work. Is, um, and that's why a lot of times I work with my partners are um, both academic and um, non-governmental organization partners that are like uh, the, the, the stability, um, you know, through changing uh, political regimes, you know, in different places. So in terms of thinking about creating social, social change, it's good to have multiple um, partners, but particularly partners who are embedded in the communities where they work. Um, so thinking of data gathering, not only for research, but as a political act to not only study poverty, but to transfer inequity or help, you know, whether it's health or economic or housing, but as, a, as data to transform uh, the very conditions that people are living in. 
Um, and then again, community-based design precedents. This was a, an image of us building um, the biogas digester in um, this. The middle image is in Ghana. Um, again, in that project, often the government will, you know, and the private sector are risk averse to trying new things. And so that's another thing you can do is partner with communities to pilot things and and provide proof of concept that can then become the basis for for policy. Um, that can expand access to service in this services in this case clean energy and then on the right the importance of mobilizing local knowledge we we um, in the two communities that didn't have access to to water you know when I brought my students there you know we had our own ideas about what it meant not to have access to water you know thinking about the human right to water framework it was very individual you know based on individual human rights but then when we work with community members they we totally redesigned uh, the, the questions and the questionnaire um, came with fully new questions that then uh, were put into the, the cell phones and used to, to collect data. So all of that is really critical to um, doing this kind of research. You totally ask different questions that lead to totally different solutions. And that's part of changing the power relations, right? Who gets to define the problem, define the solution. So when you partner with a members, now a different set of people are defining the problems and that means a different set of solutions. Um, can be possible. So on that note, um, we're going to just end, oh, I think um, we're going to uh, just briefly uh, talk about reflections and then um, open it up to uh, Q&A. Um, um, oh, go ahead. Samina, I was going to say uh, that I think we're going to move to Q&A for the uh, sake of time. Oh, okay. We're going to we're going to we're going to Sorry, Sorry, all the technical like we're running out of time, have so. slowed oh. us down. Um, I apologize, but we will send all the attendees your contact info so that you can um, perhaps, if you're willing, have conversations individually. So we, as you have been talking, Charisma, and uh, based on the prior comments from Margareta, we have received some fantastic questions uh, so I'm going to kick off by requesting Margareta to reflect on what she heard and experienced both from working with you um, and what would she say, what would you say, Margareta, to faculty about what not to do when beginning a project? You told us and Charisma told us what to watch out for. She has laid out some founding principles for us in research, which were incredible, but what is it that we should avoid? That's a question that has come up. So I think it's, um, it's, it's, we get into a very strong mindset around um, not only knowing the answers, but also knowing the right questions. Um, and so I think it's so critical to be hold a, um, in Buddhism, we call it a beginner's mind around what the questions are that should be asked, right? And to actually co-design the questions themselves with the people who live in those neighborhoods, those communities who are being most impacted by what, uh, whatever injustice or issue you're looking at. Thank you, Margareta. The next question, I'm actually combining a couple of them for you, Charisma. Um, both are coming from students. And um, one is asking, how do you manage um, the challenge of funding that dictates the direction of research when you want to ensure co-production of knowledge speaks to Margareta's earlier comment about trauma of faculty disappearing. Um, and then perhaps a simpler question, why water? Why do you work on water? Do you, I just wanted to try to see if you could hear me this way through the computer, just because I have to turn off my sound. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, funding is a huge issue. Um, 
like course grants that I've gotten from the Mellon Foundation uh, to run these studios to do uh, work in the community. Obviously, those have been even probably the most um, flexible uh, get under the, the, the umbrella of teaching, um, you know, be able to do partnerships with community members. But I think the partnership, like how do you withstand the funding cycles of donors? It is and that's why the partnerships are part are, are important working with community members to channel their uh their questions and needs into the, the moment so you know climate change and resilience are some of the things that in our field are driving a lot of funding um and so channeling those issues into those those kind of questions that funders you know want to give money to are are you know kind of how I've been able to do it, but it's not an easy to do it. Um, do it by uh, you know having using contracts with uh, UN agencies um, to do projects. Um, sometimes consulting, I've used that, like just getting my own grants to do consulting in order to do the kind of research that I'm um, um, I would say it's important because I know back to uh, what Rita said at the beginning in terms of institutional support, it's important to have um, institutions on campus that provide uh, at least seed money for some of these initiatives. And that's one thing I'll say that's been helpful at, at Berkeley. There's a number of institutions that are interdisciplinary, uh, bring groups together to and, and can bring partners together from other countries um, or locally to plan uh for for projects and, and having those like pockets of money to even have the ability to plan together um and the institution providing that um maybe as a leverage for other external funding is really, um is really important um so i hope that answers the the funding a little bit of the funding question maybe if there are some follow-ups and the water yeah so i you know i kind of talked about how my um the, you know, got into, before academia, I was in international development and water was an issue. Um, when I worked in Zimbabwe um, with ethnic minorities who faced discrimination under the um, Ian Smith, the white minority regime, Zimbabwe had a system of South Africa's neighbor to the north, actually. Um, and, you know, I work with communities that you know, had no water, had to walk for miles and miles. We were working on questions of human rights and helping them, let, you know, understand the Constitution and leverage their, the knowledge of the Constitution to advocate. Um, but just seeing that fundamental these drove me to look at water. And again, in Angola, you know, resettling internally people displaced by war, the fundamental question was always getting access to, to water and working in Lagos where you have a mega city and people don't have water and it's such a basic need. It, it impacts everything when it comes to develop. It's fundamental to life. So many people don't have access to that is, is just, it's, it's something that motivates my research, even though I do other things, but water is at the core uh, of what I do. This life. And I just uh, piggyback on uh, Charisma's comment on funding. I completely conf uh, agree with her. The it's very important to think about how to position your uh, idea along with the priorities of funding agencies, such as sustainability, climate change. And even if you don't directly see that connection, I think finding that angle will go a very long way. The real challenge for funding is that these projects take much longer than the average project and having continuous funding so that you don't abandon your community partners and reinforce the difficulties of building these partnerships is the real, real difficulty. And the third thing I want to point out is don't ignore foundations, local, state, national, international. You'll be amazed at how, how much you can pick up from foundations as well. Thank you for that, Chitra. We have some fantastic questions that are still coming up, and I regret to say that I will not get to all of them. Um, if I may close with a question that is directed this time to Margareta, would, what advice do you have for early career researchers who want to start working on uh, police reform?
It's a very timely question. And, and there are um, local organizations in um, every city in our nation who've been um, addressing these issues for a really long time. And um, so I think that's really important. There's a lot of social media attention being focused on um, uh, new efforts, which is great. But I, I think uh, uh, to really truly understand um, the complexities of the issues, um, I would make sure that you're reaching out to the groups, the grassroots groups um, that don't have the media profile, but who've been in the community for a long time, um, struggling and, and working for reform and, and transformation. Um, and and uh, to what um, Crisma and I both talked about, to really partner with them and ask them um, what, how you can help them with the efforts they've been engaged in for a long time. Thank you both of you for joining us. And I am so sorry about the delay in technology. Charisma, any parting words before we wish everybody goodbye? Uh, yeah, um, one, I ditto Margareta because I saw the question about how do you get involved in, in uh, working with communities and do it. it's partnering. That's it's partnering with, with people and communities that are already embedded in a community. No matter what you wanna work on, there are people that are already there network. And so partnering with them is the way to go. And then that's your entry point. And a lot of listening, a lot of deep listening before you just jump in with ideas. A lot of listening. And, let, and you have to realize you, who you are as a researcher. I was just talking about this with my students the other day. When you go into, as an academic, when you go into the community, it's not just you as your individual research project, but you represent the institution. And so you have to also know what your institution has done in your neighborhoods. This is an issue here in Berkeley in terms of promoting gentrification and displacement or hiring people that are doing polluting communities in the, the, the Bayview, inviting people to speak here that are part of corruption in the Bayview Hunters Point when it comes to the shipyard cleanup of a, a Superfund site. You carry that institutional baggage, it's not just you. And so you kind of have to know because your partners will also ask you to advocate for the university to stop doing what it's doing. Like not only do your research, but also know what the university is doing in the surrounding communities. Um, and then I would just recommend everybody to read Tema Okun's uh, White Habits of White Supremacy Culture. Because I think there's a lot of parallels in that in terms of, that might be a loaded term uh, for people, but I think when you read it, there's a lot of parallels to the way we conduct research. He talks about the focus on urgency and deadlines and perfectionism and quantity over quality and there only be one right way and power hoarding and fear of conflict and you know progress only meaning more and bigger all those things you know there there's there's things that we think are part of professionalism you know the the, the push to publish more articles and all those things that that drive our research agendas and so i think it's just a good piece to reflect on both how we do research and how we and how we teach but um, I just, the, the final note is just partnering. Like that's how you get involved, work, find the people who are already, the grassroots people are already doing the work and find ways to work and support and support them. That's a fantastic lasting uh, recommendation for us, Charisma. Thank you to both of you. I invite attendees who are on the call to drop an adjective in the chat box to let <laughs> guests know how they are feeling, how you are feeling. And with that, I bring this conversation to a close. Uh, colleagues, you are welcome to join us at the next conversation about co-production of knowledge that is available on the website for Community for Global Health Equity. We will stop recording this conversation and we are bringing this to a close. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. <laughs>